All right, so uh, my name is Luis Vasquez and I'm with UCI Beale Applied Innovation. I wanna thank everyone for joining us for our weekly webinar series. Um, our goal of the series of events is to continue to connect the Southern California and in fact broader than that now ecosystem since we can do it with experts and resources that will help the entrepreneurs and the founders navigate through this current crisis and most importantly to thrive uh, during our recovery. So for today's uh, webinar, we're honored to have Dan Rosen, who uh, most of you can see on the screen here uh, next to me or, or uh, soon. He's the chair of the Alliance of Angels. It's a position that he's held for 22 years. And uh, Dan has a very impressive resume of leadership positions within the technology industry, but I'm gonna let him describe that since uh, rather than going through it myself. But um, uh, quickly, before we get started, um, I'd like to bring on uh, Richard Sudek to say a few words. Um, and let's see, let's, uh, sorry about that. Should have made, allowed Richard the opportunity to talk beforehand. Hi, I think I'm on, Luis. You are, go ahead, Richard. Okay, so just, I just quickly want to say uh, thanks to Dan. Uh, Dan. Both Dan and I have served on the ACA Angel Capital Association Board He's been involved with the Lewis Villalobos um, Award yearly for the ACA, which is picking the top uh, angel funded startup in the country. Uh, he's well respected across the country. And I just want to thank him for taking the time to do this. Um, we really appreciate it. Also, I want to give a shout out to Luis uh, for putting this on. This is our third one and he's doing a great job with this. And we hope um, you're finding uh, these uh, conversations of value. So Luis, thanks for the great job you're doing with this. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. So uh, with that, um, let's, uh, let me give you a little bit of background on this. So last month, Dan wrote a blog post uh, with advice on how startups can manage this during the economic crisis. And then by popular demand, people reaching out to him, he wrote a follow-up piece on how angel investors can, uh, can navigate their way through this crisis. And then uh, both posts have taken off. Uh, Richard, in fact, forwarded one of those to me. And we were lucky enough that we were able to get to him early and say, Dan, can we have an hour of your time to elaborate on this? Because apparently uh, there were a lot of requests that uh, followed for that. So uh, because of Dan's relationship with Richard and with us, we were pleased that we were able to get to him first before he was inundated and on quite a few of them. So uh, a few logistical details before we get started. So in order to make this more efficient, um, all of the attendees will be muted. And, uh, but if you do have a question, we encourage you to put it into the question box, which you'll see in your Zoom chat control bar, you'll see a Q&A. And you can put the questions in there and we'll answer them either during the event or we'll grab them and answer them uh, afterwards. So, and finally, the, this presentation is being recorded, just so you know, it'll be mostly for us, but we'll have this recording available on the COVE's website, which is innovation.uci.edu under the events tab. So we'll post that later on this afternoon. Also keep your eyes out on, on, uh, for our emails and our social media for our next event, which will be next week, Friday, the April 24th at this exact same time, 11 o'clock. And we're going to have Alex Andrianopoulos from Kairos Ventures. And he's gonna talk about investing in university startups and uh, what the COVID-19 crisis means for that entire ecosystem. So keep an eye on the details for those. And so uh, with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. And so Dan, um, why, don't you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that background that you have and, and kind of the journey that has led you here today? Well, I, I think sometimes when you have gray hair, um, most entrepreneurs think you're too old to be relevant and uh, that this period of time is sort of teaching us an important lesson that sometimes having gray hair with some knowledge and experience can be useful for people. Um, I've been accused by many of being somebody who just can't hold a job because uh, it seems like about every six or eight years I have to do a major career change. But I started as a research biophysicist, which is somewhat relevant these days. Uh, because it helps you understand uh, the data behind the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, I got a PhD from UC San Diego, so I'm Southern California with some roots. Um, 
wound up uh, taking a, a job at Bell Labs and then moving on to AT&T and spending a good deal of time there. My last job there was uh, interesting because I got to start AT&T's consumer internet business. Um, was recruited away by a little Seattle-based startup called Microsoft. Uh, did that and for various and odd reasons wound up becoming Bill's deal guy for a number of years even though that was never really my job. Uh, and uh, left after six years at Microsoft to start a venture capital fund in Seattle. Did that for about six years. And along the way was asked by Bill's dad, Bill Gates Sr., to uh, help start a group called the Alliance of Angels, recognizing there was not sufficient seed funding in Seattle at the time. And the Alliance of Angels has been a passion project for me for the last 23 years. I've been chair from after the first meeting until now, um, even though I keep trying to hand it off, but nobody seems to want to take the ball. Uh, so I just keep shooting. But um, we have 150 members where we capped our membership because we didn't want to get any larger than that. Uh, we don't allow service providers as members, so it's only active angels. And along with Tech Coast Angels is one of the top 10 most active angel groups in the country. Our typical year, we only have one chapter, but our typical year is about 10 million and 20 to 25 startups. And over the course of the 23 years, we've invested, oh, about 150 million and about 225 startups have had more than 40 exits. Um, IRR over that period is something between 20 and 30%. So pretty nice. decent nice. track record sure. for an sure. angel group. Uh, we have a waiting list to get in at this point, although I suspect COVID-19 is gonna make uh, the membership <sighs> cap and waiting list not terribly relevant. <sighs> and I see my sidekick here is trying to speak up, but. Uh, we'll try to get her quiet. Um, so that's uh, pretty much my background. I think my personal portfolio is uh, is running at about 60 active companies and in the course of the last uh, uh, 20 or so years have had over 120 investments. So um, that's my background. Wow, my goodness. Uh, personally, don't know how you keep track of 60 active investments, but that's that is impressive. Let me ask you Excel. from from, from that uh, that that experience that you have, you know, working at AT and T, working for Microsoft, angel investor for for quite some time. Um, you know, which which one of those experiences, if any, has really kind of shaped your outlook for for this crisis, or or maybe what other event or crisis is really kind of shaping your view about what we're going through right now? You know, it's sort of a little bit of everything. Uh, I've never been asked that question before, but I, I think that certainly the biophysicist research part of me uh, made me understand when I saw the first glimmers of the epidemic in China that uh, this is gonna be an exponential worldwide occurrence. Uh, globalization has happened and the dread of all of us for years has been a disease where asymptomatic people are contagious. And that, that's the case with COVID-19. Uh, and, and therefore you knew it was gonna spread and it was gonna spread exponentially. Uh, I also, because I do some med tech investing, knew that the hospital system in the US had a bed capacity of roughly a million beds with about a 10th of those ICU beds. And, and you knew that if this did take hold, the biggest danger was gonna be overwhelming the hospital system. And unfortunately in certain areas that's proven to be true. Luckily, I think in, in those most effective areas, we may be getting down from the peak, we're seeing fewer ICU admissions than um, releases. And uh, that is a good thing because as long as we can keep the bounds of the epidemic within uh, the, the ability of our hospital system to absorb them. Uh, this uh, will still be a disaster, but we mitigate the amount of disaster it will be. 
Right, right. I think uh, I think your you, great turn of phrase there. Kind of, you hear about unmitigated disasters and mitigated disasters, and I think <laughs> maybe hoping for that mitigated disaster part. Let's um let's go back. I want to touch on something else because I know you're you're very active, not just with um with Alliance of Angels. You're a Tech Coast Angels member, and you're you're involved with angel organizations, kind of across the across the country so what what makes a good angel investing ecosystem um you know what is, is there something that uh that different areas or communities can think about when they're creating their angel ecosystem i'm just sending a note to get the dogs quieted <laughs> your dogs um, can take test, text messages that's pretty good yeah they're usually pretty pretty mellow but somebody came to the front door okay some no worries. Uh, the, the, the angel ecosystem is interesting because particularly at times like this and times of crisis um, is, is the best time to work with other angels to gain a broader perspective. I, I think that um, like Tech Coast Angels, the Alliance of Angels saw a pretty substantial increase in membership over the last four years. And that was driven by the fact of people having been very successful in their companies, their companies getting acquired and making a lot of money, and then deciding that they wanted to get back in some way and invest in startups. And uh, you can do that on your own. But the problem with doing it on your own is you're on your own. And a typical story I hear from new members, because I try to meet with a lot of people, including at TCA San Diego, where I'm the member, and the story goes very similarly that, hey, I, I thought this was going to be easy. I made a lot of money. I did six investments in my first three months. And six months later, they were all out of business. What did I do wrong? And then you come to uh, a group meeting and you say, ah, oh, I get it. There really is some method to the madness of the way groups screen and, and, and uh, diligence deals that I never would have done on my own. Right. And particularly in a time of crisis like this, working in a group can be really helpful because people will see things about deals that you miss. That, that's always going to be true. Sometimes they'll see things that you look at and say, okay, well, that's not important in the deal to me. And so I always urge people, even working in a group, to sort of pick the, the three to five things that are going to make this deal one that I have to do and three to five things that are deal killers for me. So um, that's really uh, the reason to be in a group. And I think this is a great time to, to be in groups and forming them. Yeah, that's interesting. A little bit of a kind of counterintuitive about why the timing might be good. So you told us a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, your training as a biochemist. You saw what was happening in China and, and saw the concerns there. But um, you're also obviously from Seattle, so you guys started to feel it kind of uh, earlier. If in fact uh, you know you you participate in that, so so. But I want to kind of instead of the the health aspect to it, I want to talk about the economic things. When when did you start to get concerned about the economic consequences of this, and what were yeah. what were those initial concerns? How have they played out? The day the it was clear that the epidemic had hit the United States, unfortunately occurred at a nursing home in my hometown, Kirkland, Washington. And they had no clue how the virus had reached there. Mm. Uh, the, first, the, the, the first known case in the United States, which as it turns out was probably not the first case, was a gentleman in Everett, Washington, who checked into the hospital with uh, respiratory symptoms, and they figured out he had COVID-19, they isolated him, and he did recover. But about two weeks later, they announced that there were a number of cases at this nursing home. Uh, at that point, you sort of knew the genie was out of the bottle. And you knew that the only way, there was no known treatment and no known cure and no vaccine. And it looked like at least 18 months to a vaccine from that point. Uh, and with no treatment, you knew that this thing was going to spread rapidly. So 
uh, it was pretty clear the only thing that was going to work was social distancing and that meant closing down a lot of businesses. Uh, I could see the writing on the wall from that. I knew that this was going to be uh, an epidemic in the US and a pandemic around the world and that we were going to grind to a halt. I don't think anybody could forecast you were going to go from one of the hottest economies the world has ever seen to zero in the course of a couple of weeks. Right. Uh, or, that's never or, happened before. Right. Or, or in fact, negative, right? I mean, you didn't just go to zero. You went, you went negative. Well, I mean, the economy sort of went to zero. The, the rate of growth went to negative. <laughs> yeah, <you're right>. But, <laughs> but yeah. I think that, you know, the moment you realize how dependent we are to, uh, on all sorts of things that require personal contact, mm -hmm. that's when it became pretty evident that this was going to make the 2008 and the 2000.com bust uh, look like uh, as much, much more minor events. And the reason is that in 2008, it was led by the banks and the mortgage industry. And you could see the disaster that could occur if they collapsed. Back in 2000, it was a sector of the economy, the tech sector, that sponsored the dot-com bubble. And when that burst, there was pain throughout that sector. But the broad economy as a whole didn't suffer. The broad economy sort of went on with their daily business. Truck drivers drove trucks to deliver groceries. Uh, farmers kept doing farming. And while money and liquidity was tight, things continued. Uh, but then um, it was pretty evident that in this one, it was going to affect everybody and everything. And uh, once the containment failed, uh, it, you knew that there was going to be a lot of economic harm. Right. And, and you've, uh, you've provided some nice advice, kind of general advice for, for everyone. I actually thought I'd uh, bring, up this, uh, bring up this slide here because this is kind of your, your let's what what we should all do so you should probably you can probably see that uh, that screen there and so maybe this is your advice for all of us so so why don't you uh, lay it on us before we kind of jump into the specifics for startups and angels well in in any crisis um, there is a level of panic and some of it's justifiable i think much of the the crisis here is justifiable you you really don't want to avoid the constraints put on society. You want to social distance. You want to make sure that uh, you sort of create a fortress around you to keep the virus from entering your home, things like that. Uh, and you want to do everything you can to stop the spread. But in the meantime, it's worthwhile to recognize it for what it is and not make it for more than what it is. Take a deep breath. Recognize that like any other crisis we've ever faced, this too will pass. It may take 18 months, but this too will pass. Uh, and then try to learn what we can from previous ones. Uh, from a medical point of view, learn what happened in 1918 with the so-called Spanish flu. And learn what happened with SARS and other things. But from an economic point of view, uh, as I said, this is really a different kind of beast because this one affects absolutely everybody in the economy. And people are making analogies to the Great Recession in the 30s, but in point of fact, that took years to develop. This happened overnight. So this will affect everyone. Learn what you can, but don't overreact to it. I do believe we're going to see a slow recovery starting in June. And last night on the news, uh, the administration laid out for the governors what they thought the governors ought to do. And I think the governors had already been saying the same thing, that once we get back to normal and have a, a fully deployed vaccine, until then, it's going to be something that's gradual, that we'll have to take it a day at a time. We'll have to wait till rates begin to decline to get anybody back to work. And once we do, put in place a great regime of testing and tracking. And uh, we will see uh, normalcy beginning to come back. As I said earlier, the trick is to bring that normalcy back to limit the number of cases, 
until we get to the point where the hospitals can keep and medical system can keep up with it. Right, right. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, go to the next uh, area here, which is um, kind of what what is what what's your advice to startups? You've got sixty active. Uh, portfolio companies, and uh, you're probably influencing many, many more. So, so let's uh, let's drill into these. Kind of what what should startups be thinking about, and what do they need to do to survive this? Well, you know, the number one thing, and and everybody sort of yawns when I say it and say, well, that's sort of obvious is survive. You got to survive if you're going to be there afterwards. And I I like to tell an anecdote. Um, I was a venture capitalist during the 2000.com bust, and we had invested in a marketing automation company out of Indianapolis. Um, you know, people like to be in the number one or two company in the field, the early, uh, early movers, and this wasn't the number one or two company, but it had a great team, and it was taking a different approach, largely because they were outside of Silicon Valley. And then the dot-com crash happened, and they had about six really well-financed venture-backed competitors that had already taken in tens and tens of millions of dollars. And my, our company had, didn't have that much capital. So for them, going to a lower burn and trying to live within their means turned out to be easier than the ones that had had the bigger companies and bigger burns. Uh, roll the clock forward three years. Uh, and being in Indianapolis, by the way, helped. Salaries were a lot lower. And what happened was they were still alive. And uh, six or eight years later, they were the only ones still standing. And they got bought for $600 million, which sort of made our fund. And so the trick is figuring out all those things you need to do to survive. Uh, one thing under that bullet that I'm, I'm in the middle of writing up as the next one of my blog posts is uh, communication. Part of survival is telling people you're still alive. And that includes your share owners, that includes your employees, that includes your customers, but you need to communicate and communicate differently to all of your different stakeholders, but communicate well. And uh, I, I've now given this talk probably six times, and each time there's entrepreneurs on, and if it's a small enough group, I'll ask people to raise their hand how many people have sent out a share in our letter since this started. And, um, and the last one I did, out of like 15 people, there were zero share in our letters that had gone out. And the next day I got three. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that it's really important to communicate. It doesn't need to be a 20 page memo. It needs to be a very short brief thing saying, uh, we're alive, here's what we're doing, here's why we think we're gonna survive, here's what the future holds for us as best we can tell, call with any questions. And I, I think it's critical now, you know, as we are socially isolated, not to be business isolated. Now, the most important thing about survival is number two, which is cash is king. Uh, it, and I know you hear this a lot and it's very obvious, but I, I don't think any company is gonna be able to sort of weather the storm unless there's something unusual about them without at least 12 months and more likely 18 to 24 months of cash in the bank. Um, very few companies have that today. So, pushing down to number six and combining it with number two, you got to cut your burn. And I've had some board calls where <laughs> one, one company said, we really cut our burn. We canceled all travel and we canceled all the conferences for the remainder of the year. And I said, no, you didn't do that. You had to do that. Right. There is no travel and there are no conferences. So yes, you're not doing that. You got to figure out how to cut your burn. I have another company that um, very proudly uh, did a, a investor call and announced that they were um, cutting their burn by 50%. They had canceled four consulting contracts that they had uh, decided not to backfill any losses and they had some open positions which they didn't hire. 
and uh, all of the senior management team had agreed to a 50% salary cut. And they did cut their burn by 50%. Uh, the reason that's so important is that almost every plan we as angels look at say in 12 months, we're gonna raise a venture round. And you gotta forget about that. It, you may be one of the lucky ones. Some people will actually get to raise a venture round and raise more money. But right now, every venture capitalist in the country is looking at their portfolio, looking at their cash needs over the next 24 months and doing triage. A lot of good companies will not make it through this. A lot of good companies are gonna cut, close down because they run out of cash. And it's gonna run out of cash because they can't raise more money and revenue is very likely to be curtailed. Now, people are still in a bit of denial about this and saying, but I'm talking to my customers and they say, oh, as soon as we get back from COVID-19, we're gonna sign your contract. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are gonna be opportunities even during the downturn. Um, the, the most quoted one on the news is Ford started making respirators and face masks. But I have a startup in my portfolio called Transformative Med. And when this first began to look like it was something, it occurred to me that during my diligence on them, the people who benefited from their product were the residents and interns in hospitals, the point of the spear, as I like to call them. And some claimed it, it, it saved them more than 50% of their patient time because they didn't have to enter a lot of ridiculous information with the electronic medical record system. Well, I called them up and said, hey, what can you do for COVID-19? And two weeks later, they shipped a COVID-19 product to their anchor customer, which is Harborview Trauma Center in, in Washington, Seattle. And uh, three days later, they implemented it at Evergreen Hospital, which was the original point of uh, infection for COVID-19. And Evergreen wasn't even one of their customers and they did it for free. Hmm. And so they've now done, I think, 15 or 16 of them around the country. And uh, more than half were not existing customers. So this is an important thing because if you find an opportunity like this to make your customers love you, uh, when this is abating, those customers will still love you. And then the last one I wanna to touch on is the inflection point because this is a key point to all entrepreneurs. It's hard to tell when that inflection point is gonna hit and it's probably gonna hit different for every business. Um, I, I don't know without being intimately involved in a business how to give you advice, but just stay aware of it because there will come a series of inflection points when for your business, people will begin to come back to life and being early to recognize that and taking the appropriate action is really critical because at the end of the day, you might find that you are gonna be doing even better because you recognize that inflection point and acted on it quickly and responded to customer needs. It may not be your number one product. It may not be the plan that you thought you would execute, but hey, we like to invest in entrepreneurs who have that kind of flexibility and know how to pivot when they see a great pivot point. And so these inflection points can be very important. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's great insight. And uh, you know, what I, what I appreciate that is certainly from an opportunities perspective. I think most, most entrepreneurs are probably, you know, they're, they're hardwired to look for opportunities and to um, understand that, you know, the situation they're in has this many, you know, options that they can, they can choose from. I think the inflection point though is a great, uh, great insight because that might not be as easy to recognize. And, you know, it's, it's probably going to take your team. It's probably going to take your board. It's probably going to take various people to, to give you those data points that are going to allow you to kind of determine, yeah, is this an inflection point? Have things really changed. You know, there's the, 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 you, you get at the experience question here again. I think some experienced entrepreneurs or some very clever ones will see this coming and be able to react. But the danger in it is, uh, and th this by the way is about cash is king and downsizing as well. Uh, timing is critical on these things. Um, 
I've been on boards of companies that despite board advice, uh, refuse to cut burn early. And the problem with waiting until you know you need to do it is it completely limits your optionality. If you wait until it, it's, you, you know you have no choice but to cut the burn, by then you probably waited too long and cutting burn doesn't really help you much. It doesn't help you survive. It gives the optics of surviving a little bit, but by that point, it's probably too late. Cutting early enough that you can then redirect some resources for the inflection point is the key. Not too early, but at the right time. And in, in situations like this, timing is just so critical. You know, uh, Dan, uh, feel free to say you're not sure. Tough question though. So you cut the burn by reducing salaries of those that you have and those other things. But the next step is furloughs, layoffs, et cetera. You know, what, what, what can startups do to, um, you know, if they're going to have to cut the burn, they're going to have to do some layoffs. Anything creative on that side that helps somehow retain either the goodwill or the expertise or, or, or the ability to maybe get some of these vital resources back when they're able to? Yeah, there, there's three pieces of advice I have. Number one is communicate. Number two is communicate. Number three is communicate. I was talking to one CEO earlier this week and he did something I never would have done and never heard of anybody doing is he took out his phone and took pictures of his bank accounts and he sent it to all of his employees along with a small spreadsheet that said, if we keep going at this pace, this is what happens. And he got them thinking very creatively and some of the employees came up with ways to cut burn, but in general, every employee in the company was willing to take a cut and some were willing to be furloughed. Now, I, I urge you to talk to your uh, lawyer about this because in many states there are laws that say if somebody is working, you have to pay them. And, <laughs> and so be careful not to ask people to do free work because you may be putting yourself at jeopardy. But you should think of ways to cut the burn any way you can. Furloughs are certainly part of it. In terms of keeping people tied to the company is go to your board and ask for an extension of option privileges uh, until after the crisis is over. So even though somebody may be furloughed and not part, of an, uh, not part of the employee team anymore, you can allow their options to continue to go or maybe even vest during that period. Right, uh, or eliminate the 30-day window where they have to, have to vest them. Yep, and, or maybe not eliminate but extend so that sure. they have a reason to come back after the extension. So allow bridging of continuity, allow a lot of things like that. There's a number of things that you can do to keep the goodwill of people and you should do them all. But you, you really need to uh, be very cogent on taking deliberate early action. Waiting until you have to do it is usually never a good strategy. Okay. Hey, um, there's plenty of resources. There have been dozens of webinars on, you know, what are the, you know, economic injury disaster loans? What is PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program? What you can do, how to do it. So I really don't want to get into that here because there's plenty of, of, uh, of resources for that. So rather, I'll ask you, um, what are you hearing from your startups um, whether they've, uh, have any been successful, have any received cash in the bank, have any um, been approved for EIDLs or, or PPPs so far? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, uh, but very few. Uh, I've, um, I was on a webinar yesterday um, and asked, it was all, all CEOs of startups and I asked, so how many, is there anybody here who's actually gotten the PPP, gotten the cash in the bank? And I heard from four or five that said they had been approved but had not yet gotten the cash. And one person said, yeah, I got the cash. And I said, do you mind me asking which bank you used? And it turns out it was a local bank that specializes in SBA loans. 
uh, there are a number of large tech banks that were never SBA lenders. Mm -hmm. And it turns out they uh, applied for and got into the SBA programs. But given that they're not long-term, long-standing SBA lenders, they're, they're having trouble with some of the minutia and paperwork that comes with such government programs. Uh, yeah. So I, I'd apply, I'd try. I think anything you can do to get non-equity cash in is a great thing. Uh, even if you wind up having to pay back the low interest rate loans, you should. A lot of venture back companies went out and got debt right away. And they uh, seem to have been pretty successful at getting the debt in. I think the debt market has, has sort of been cap capped out now though. And uh, unless PPP is reauthorized in, in a timely fashion, uh, I'm not counting on uh, a lot of good coming from that. Right, right. Okay, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, uh, oops, I went a little bit too far. Let's uh, move on to angels and other investors. So uh, these are kind of some bullet points taken from your blog post on what angel investors uh, need to think about. And, and it'll be a good time to throw in one of the questions uh, that one of our uh, attendees put up there. And it was simply, is it foolish to invest now? So uh, you can think about that, uh, replying to that as you go through your advice for angel investors and others. Well, some of my best investments and some of the industry's best investments occurred in down markets. In the aftermath of the dot-com bust, we had a company come through the Alliance of Angels that we really liked, great CEO, great founding team, particularly good uh, technical founder. Um, and we backed it in 2002, I believe, at a time when almost nobody was investing in tech. And um, they were supposed to go get, be acquired within two to three years. And we did get liquid uh, 18 months ago, thank God. And it's a little startup called DocuSign. And I now I'm kicking myself for selling my shares that were distributed to me because it went public at 32, shot up quite a bit, and now it's at 100. And I did sell most of my shares a while ago, so unfortunate. But stay in the game. Um, but it is a time to be combining a couple of my uh, things on here to be highly selective and be ruthless. Uh, your bar to enter a new company probably has gone up because you sort of figure you can do things like buy some of the stocks that have fallen by 30 or 40%. And after two years, they're gonna come back to where they were and you're, you're gonna be able to make, you know, close to two times your money in a liquid stock in the public equities market if you're clever about it. So it is a time to be highly selective. But, uh, and that goes with being ruthless. Uh, just because you've already invested in a company and they're coming back and saying, we're gonna go under if you don't invest again, be ruthless. De determine if the new deal that they're offering you um, uh, meets your hurdle rate. Uh, don't invest just because you're already in a company. Consider it like a new investment. And that, and as part of that, expect multiple rounds. A company who comes to you now and says, I just need enough to make it through to the end of the year, they're going to be back at you at the end of the year saying, we're out of money and we need more money. Uh, I would, as part of being ruthless, I would look at a company and say, tell me what your plan was to make it further on the money you have, or better yet, make it to cash flow positive on the money you have that you're raising from me. And if they can't give a good answer to that, I, I don't think I'm very interested in it. Uh, and then lastly, I would say that these two things go together. Deal terms really matter. Uh, as angels and as investors, we've gotten pretty sloppy on this over a period of time because it has been a time when it's been a very entrepreneur friendly market. And justifiably so. The market was buoyant. There was lots of money out there. There weren't that many good deals. So money chases the good deals and entrepreneurs do the capitalist thing. They say, okay, I, if you want in my deal, you got to pay a higher price. I don't have a problem with that. But 
the, con the, the other side of that same equation is that when the markets aren't very buoyant and money is very tight, the deal terms will change. Now, I, I often use the phrase, be careful, but not greedy. Uh, there are inexperienced angels who say, who, I, I think probably everybody on this call has heard the term, the golden rule. It's a venture capital term. He who has the gold sets the rules. And, and just because you can doesn't mean you should. You should roll this forward. And if you get exceptionally good terms, what does that mean for the future of the company? Just because you can doesn't mean you should on this. And I've seen people ask for a 4X liquidation preference. And you know that, that's gonna kill the company, particularly if they ever need more money. Um, so be careful. It's okay to get a participating preferred liquidation preference so your money comes out first. Not okay to get a 4X participating preferred liquidation preference not okay to do require such a low price for the amount of money going in that your ownership is not commensurate with the amount of money you put in. And you don't leave room for the entrepreneurs to do well if it works, because at some point if things go a little bit sideways, they're just gonna leave. It no longer is worth their while to stick with it. So be very careful, uh, be as ruthless as you can to get the terms you want. Don't expect to get bailed out by venture capitalists in this. Make sure that you think about the multiple rounds you're gonna to have to be put in. And then look for exits. I had one company that came through just a few months ago and um, they had had one of their customers approach them early on about buying them. And they instead decided to take in some money and see if they could build the company. Well, the uh, coronavirus hit, um, their prospects weren't looking as bright as they had been a month ago, and they were able to negotiate and accept a 2X offer. And 2X in four months, <laughs> not a bad deal, but there may be other kind of exits like this that suddenly become apparent. So be aware of them. Uh, don't, and, and this is from an entrepreneur perspective too, don't be greedy. Uh, accept what's in front of you as reality and try to react to it accordingly. Yeah, um, we were- And from, we an, were, from, from an entrepreneur perspective, recognize that in the past, your competition were other good startups. Now your competition is other good startups and public equity markets that are so depressed. Um, speaking of the exit opportunities, we uh, we were just informed yesterday that one of the companies who is resident at the Cove and has worked out of our offices for a while was acquired by a large um, uh, healthcare medical device uh, company recently. And so, so yeah, that definitely tells you that uh, you know not only are some deals moving forward, but some new deals um, have become apparent in these times where where they might not have been apparent before. So um, a couple of questions that, uh, that have come in, and I think it's, it's appropriate for this slide. So it, uh, it, one question says, as an active but relatively ex inexperienced angel, I miss the face-to-face -face component of angel activities for a host of reasons. Any suggestions for accomplishing number three, which is uh, work in a group or team, while also still being selective and ruthless and social distancing at the same time? We're here. <laughs> I mean, that's what these kind of uh, Zoom meetings and Teams meetings have been about. I, I think it's great. Uh, I've attended more of these conferences via Zoom and via Teams than I ever could have in person. I mean, for those that are curious, I'm not in Seattle, I'm in Encinitas. And we came down here for a couple of weeks on March 4th and uh, when we were scheduled to go back, I said, it's not safe to travel, we're staying. And when am I gonna go back? I don't know, <laughs> but I'm, I can work as well from here using the, the technologies at our disposal as I can from being someplace in person. There is, I, I, I don't wanna belittle it because there is a little bit of information in the person to person, eye to eye contact. 
And we're not going to get that for a while. But um, that's where I, I really like the angel business because particularly for local companies, the likelihood is somebody in your group is going to know that person well. Or if not, one step removed, you can get to somebody who you know and trust who knows that entrepreneur well. And you can call them up and ask for advice. Uh, you know, how does this person react in this situation or that situation? Uh, LinkedIn is a great tool for doing diligence, uh, even more so now than before the COVID-19. Right. So yeah, you, you can accomplish a lot of the same things using the technology at our disposal. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, we're, we're, kind of, we're winding down kind of from the list of uh, things that I had described. So um, a couple of questions that have popped up and now these will be a little bit out of order from what we were talking about, going back to what we were talking uh, earlier. So um, uh, someone would like to know your opinion about uh, testing and reopening the economy and the testing capacity. So kind of you, you're a thoughtful, guy and you've been obviously reading a lot so what do you think about uh reopening the economy and and the testing capabilities and what needs to be done i i i first of all let me caveat this I, i'm not an epidemiologist although i think 80 percent of the country is now an epidemiologist uh i do follow the math involved in it and i am intensely curious about almost everything so I do try to stay current on a lot of this. I've been doing probably too much reading uh, uh, and trying to find the, the, the real news from the fake news is, can be tough. Uh, luckily, I have a lot of friends who are expert in the field who I follow. Um, I, I do think that the country is, you know, a lot of people forecasted that it went down in a line and it's going to go up as soon as we end this. The problem is those were people who neither understood the nature of an exponential nor understood the nature of a virus. Uh, we have no immunity to this virus. It's a novel virus on humanity. These have happened in the past, but they've always been contained locally. I, I think this is the first time in our history, other than maybe the Spanish flu when there was no diagnosis that you had a virus uh, attack globally. And the reason that one did was World War I, we sent people around the world. Uh, now people travel a lot. This is with us to stay. Uh, the good news, by the way, is that I could have envisioned a worse virus than COVID-19. At least this one does not aerosolize and stay in the air for very long periods of time. Um, if that had happened and people who were not currently symptomatic were spreading it, the, the curve would have looked a lot worse. So the infectivity of this virus was not that high. Uh, having said that, um, I don't think the recovery is going to occur overnight the way the virus did. I think we're going to see a very slow, um, steady increase uh, that is going to require some leadership on the local, state, national, and global layers to make this happen. I feel very fortunate that, you know, Tony Fauci is still in his job after serving in that job for so long because there's probably no one in the world who knows how to do this kind of um, epidemiology any better than he does. And uh, I see a lot of the governors stepping up to take lead roles in this. Um, I, I think that it's easy to focus on the bad things, but the good things are there too. Our healthcare system has been very flexible in rebounding. I, unfortunately, the bad part here is that as we do go into recovery, we're gonna keep the virus alive for a lot longer than I wish it would. Uh, we're gonna start seeing local outbreaks around the country and around the world in places that will then have to go back into a lockdown until we get a, until we get a, a reasonable vaccine or herd immunity. And herd immunity, if I remember right from the math, is about 85% of any local population having been infected. 
and then we're going to have to figure out how to get everybody to, to get the vaccine. Um, I would have thought that would have been easy, but then we have the measles vaccine, never vaxxers, who caused measles outbreaks to occur in places yeah. for a disease that we thought had been eradicated. So we're going we're gonna to have to work diligently on this. Uh, the, the trick is going to be to make sure that in any local area, the infection rate does not exceed the hospital capacity in that area. And the very unfortunate part of that, because every statistic is a story, is we're going to have continuing deaths and serious illnesses until we get the vaccine out and through the population. Okay. Uh, and that's going to cause, from an economic side, not just a medical side, uh, things to recover a lot more slowly. I think consumers are going to be a lot more leery about things. I don't think the airline industry is going to bounce back right away. Um, I know uh, my, my main airline is Alaska Air, and they've now announced that they're uh, doing social distancing on their planes. They've eliminated people using the middle seats, and I think they're doing alternating rows as well. And, you know, you can't run an airline at 40% capacity and be, be profitable. Right. So it's going to take a while for all this to come back. Uh, travel industry is slow, and even the tech industry, I would not expect an immediate bounce back. So um, we have a handful of questions and I'd really like to get through them. So maybe uh, if you don't mind, Dan, we'll kind of do a speed round on, on this one. Kind of quick answers, quick shots, so people have a, have a, have a sense that uh, they were heard and, and got your insight. Um, what do you think about friends and family investing right now? Would, if you're an entrepreneur, would you go to friends and family now or would you tell an entrepreneur to lay off the friends and family? Uh, it, you know, I'm gonna give an unsatisfactory answer, it depends. If you're really confident and you can put up a plan that shows the friends and family will get you from A to B and not require more investment outside, then by all means. But if not, be very reluctant because they're your friends and family and you have to live with them. Yeah. Um, what would you think about a, all the companies, there's so many companies developing test kits right now. Is, is that going to be a viable economic model for investments and, and companies. So it's obviously something we need, you know, but there's a difference between something you need and having a good business that's gonna be profitable. What do you think about test kit companies? Uh, there'll be winners and losers. If you can pick the winner, you should pick the winner. I can. And how about uh, vaccine companies, same thing? Same, same answer. Okay, all right, good, good. Hey, I think um, that we've got a few that are that are a little bit more complex. So I think I'm just going to leave it at that for for those questions, if you don't mind. And uh, let's see, move this ahead here. So on the on the screen there, you can see Dan's contact information, and you can also see where his blog posts are. So I encourage everyone to go to his blog and uh, and check that out. Uh, there'll be those those two blogs that we just heard and, and plus the other one that uh, that he teased us with that, that he's writing here on communication, communication, communication. I think I got them all right. And, um, and, and maybe Dan, what, go ahead. And one more, I have uh, Rosen.photo. Oh, oh, okay. And, and Rosen.photo, I will, uh, I will grab that one and uh, put that one in the chat here uh, quickly. So Dan, maybe while I'm doing that, if you can, what, let us end on a, on a hopeful note or a positive note. What, what do you think are some of the positive things that, uh, that may come out of this? Well, from an entrepreneur point of view, I, I do think that we do have a lot of great companies that are started in times of stress like this. And so I think that the people who have that passion to do a startup, an entrepreneurial startup, this is a great time to do it. You, because you have to so passionately believe in what you're doing to make it work, that the likelihood is that if you're going to do it now, it's probably a good time. For people who are doing startups because they think it's a great way to live a good life and have a good, make a lot of money, not a good time to do a startup. Uh, one might argue it's never a good time to do a startup, but particularly now. Uh, from an angel, sort of a similar answer. 
this too will pass and it may lengthen the time till your exit but it's the, the, the entrepreneurial system in the U.S. is so strong and so vibrant that it will come out of this and there will be a lot of good companies. Okay, that's good. That's, uh, that's good notes to end on. And we've got a few minutes here, and I think some folks might have heard this from one of my prior webinars, but uh, some of the advice I got uh, from David Tufte once was only good things happen when you finish early. So uh, on that note, maybe we'll uh, give everybody here a gift of a few minutes, and um, we will uh, we will keep the uh, we'll, we're going to sign off, but we're going to keep the chat window open here a few minutes if you want to send a few things. There are a few questions that I couldn't get to. I apologize for that, but uh, but if you like, you can either email or contact Dan through his blog, and uh, you never know might be the might be the seed for a future blog entry, and you'll get a full blown discussion on it, and and not just a quick answer. So with that. Um, I, Dan, if, if you could hear us, I'm sure there'd be 150 plus people applauding for you. Uh, so know that the, the applause is out there virtually. And we really appreciate uh, your insights on this. This has been very enjoyable. We, we, uh, we value what you've been able to share with us.